Now, I want to change the subject a little bit. Now, we've talked a little bit about uh, uh, the potentials at interfaces. Let's talk about the potentials that are rising uh, in, a, in a slightly different way, in a, in a more thermodynamic way again. And one way we can talk about that is to think about what they call the electrochemical potential. And the, the word electrochemical potential arises by analogy to a concept in thermodynamics called the chemical potential. And let's consider a zinc ion in solution. You might remember from PCAM that we can consider the zinc ion to have a chemical potential. And that would be as a result with that ion's interaction with the solution phase, the uh, solvent, also with other ions in the solution, there'll be a chemical potential for that particular ion. And the sum of the chemical potentials in a solution gives us the free energy of the solution. So we use the, the notation mu to indicate chemical potential. So we can think about a species I in a phase alpha would have a chemical potential. So the chemical potential of species I in phase alpha would be notated like so. Also, mu sub i in species uh, in phase alpha is equal to the standard chemical potential, which would be the uh, chemical potential of that species at its standard state under standard temperature and pressure, plus the RT ln activity of species i in phase alpha. So the chemical potential of any particular species is the standard potential plus a term that depends on the activity of that species in solution. So the more concentrated that species is, the higher the activity typically will be and the chemical potential will rise accordingly. Now for a given chemical potential, we can consider that to be the partial differential of the Gibbs energy for a versus the uh, infinitesimal change in the amount of that particular species I when we hold temperature, pressure, and any other amounts of other species in, in the system constant. In other words, N sub J would be other chemical species. So it's just the partial derivative or partial differential of the free energy uh, with the, uh, the amount of species I holding other quantities constant. <clears throat> All right. So the, the free energy, uh, another way to think about that is to think about the free energy of the system is just the summation of the chemical potentials of all the species in the system. Well, I'm not going to try to teach you thermodynamics in this class, but I wanted to give you that idea. Now, taking that concept of the chemical potential a little bit further, we can consider the possibility that our species of zinc ion will interact with large-scale electric fields in the system. And this is, has to be considered to be different in principle than the small scale ion ion type interactions. In other words, we'll consider electrical interactions that are bigger than the ion ion type interaction. So if we have an electric field in our system or if we have a charged interface in the system, we have to consider the fact that the uh, zinc ion has a positive charge. And so to account for that fact, the um, they come up with the so-called electrochemical potential. And the electrochemical potential is written the same way but with a bar over the top. And so for species I in phase alpha, the electrochemical potential is equal to the chemical potential of species I in phase alpha plus um, a charged or an electrostatic term, I should say, 
where Z again is the charge and F is the Faraday and phi sub alpha is the inner potential of our species, or of our phase alpha. So this is the charge of our species. Now, of course, for an uncharged species, the electrochemical potential is just going to be equal to the chemical potential because Z would be zero. But for a zinc ion, Z sub I would be plus two. And for, a, say, a chloride ion, Z sub I would be minus one. F, again, is the Faraday. So here's our electrostatic interaction with our large-scale electric fields. Again, not an ion-ion interaction, but a large-scale interaction. Okay. We can also define in a similar way the electrochemical Gibbs free energy of the system, uh, and that would be in a similar, we'd have a similar sort of uh, way to write it as here. So we can expand our definition a little bit. The electrochemical potential of species I in phase alpha is equal to the standard chemical potential of species I in phase alpha plus RT ln activity of species I in phase alpha plus our electrostatic term Z sub I F times phi, sub al phi superscript alpha. So what's this electrochemical potential going to do for us? Well, let's first of all examine some of the properties of the electrochemical potential. As I've already mentioned, we can immediately suggest that the uh, electrochemical potential of an uncharged species is equal to the chemical potential of an uncharged species. So any neutral or molecular species, we can write that down directly. Point two, uh, for a pure phase at unit activity, pure phase alpha, the electrochemical potential is equal to the chemical potential in that pure phase. Why is that? Well, again, in that pure phase, we don't have to worry about uh, the uh, electrostatic effects. I'm sorry, I screwed this up. Let's write that again. Um, for example, uh, it's not really, let's suppose our phase, let's suppose our phase alpha is equal to zinc metal. Well, in that case, what I'm saying is that the electrochemical potential of the zinc in the zinc metal is equal to the chemical potential of the zinc in the zinc metal. Also, third point is for an electron in the metal. And when I say metal, we're also talking about things like carbon, which is a solid conductor. Uh, the electrochemical potential of that electron in species al in phase alpha is going to be the standard chemical potential of that electron in species alpha minus F phi of alpha. All right, and that's just the same as we've written previously for any given chemical species. Uh, we don't have to consider, though, the activity is approximately constant for an electron. There's so many electrons in a metal that a small amount of there's never any significant change in the activity of the electrons in the metal, so we don't have to consider the uh, activity of the electrons. Uh, they never change. 
The other thing to think about is that the electrochemical p potential of uh, the electrons in species alpha is another way of saying the Fermi level. Point number four, at equilibrium, the electrochemical potential of species I in phase alpha is going to be equal to the electrochemical potential of species I in phase beta if alpha and beta are in equilibrium. And they have to be in contact too, typically. Um, An example, again, we talked about before, that for copper and zinc, the electrochemical potential of the electrons in the copper would have to be equal to the electrochemical potential of the electrons in the zinc. <clears throat> However, Though what's not true are statements like this where we have copper and zinc again in contact with each other. Uh, the electrochemical potential of uh, the copper in the copper phase is not in general equal to the electrochemical potential of the zinc in the copper phase. What, basically the reason for that is that the that's never an equilibrium situation. If we have two metals contacting each other, they don't ever reach an equilibrium where the zinc is in equilibrium with the, in, in the copper phase because the rate of transport for the zinc into the copper is too slow for equilibrium to be effectively maintained. <clears throat> that also would generally be true that for the electrons and the two metals in contact will be the same, will have the same Fermi level and the same electrochemical potential of the electrons in those materials. Also it's true would be for metals and semiconductors. The Fermi levels also in those cases tend to line up and you get uh, equal Fermi levels in that case. Now, generally for pure phases, or for single phases, I should say, we don't usually have to worry about trying to consider the effects of the electrochemical potential. And for example, the book has a proof of that. They'd say, let's take some acetic acid and have it be in equilibrium with the protons and the acetate ions. And uh, what's the uh, chemical potential of that, what's the effect of the electrochemical potential in that particular system? Well, we can write down the electrochemical potential of the acetic acid in solution, that LS stands for solution phase, and the electrochemical potential for the protons in that solution, and the electrochemical potential for the um, acetate ions in that solution. Well, we can write right away that the electrochemical potential of the uncharged species is equal to the chemical potential of that uncharged species in solution. And also we can write that for the acetate, acetic acid, the electrochemical potential has to be equal to the um, electrochemical, potential, electrochemical potentials of the components in the solution because they're in equilibrium. And we can expand that and, and uh, um, insert our previous um, result 
and we find that uh, for particular, for the chemical potential of the acetic acid, it has to be equal to the standard potential of the hydrogen ions plus the activity, of the activity of the hydrogen ions in solution plus the electrochemical acid or the electrostatic effect of the hydrogen ions in that solution plus the chemical, standard chemical potential of the acetate ions plus the activity effect of those acetate ions plus the uh, electrostatic term in that particular case. And so what you can see is that um, these two terms cancel out. And if we continue our system, we can see that, uh, oops, let's try that again. We can see that um, this part of the thing would be the standard potential of the acetic acid plus the activity term for the acetic acid. in solution equal to the above. And if we uh, rearrange it, Here we have a term that would be equal, equal to the standard free energy of the uh, Gibbs free energy equals to the RTLN of the activity terms of our particular system. And that's a form, that's a form that you might be familiar with in the system. But you notice in that final formulation that the potential of that particular phase, that pure phase, single phase, has no effect on the uh, system, as we'd expect. We, by adding this uh, electrochemical potential, it doesn't affect how we treat uh, systems that would not be previously be have an electrochemical potential to worry about. However, when we have electrochemical cells, now we can start using our electrochemical or electrochemical potential to good effect. And let's rewrite another cell. This is one that we've written before. It's getting to be our favorite. Oops. Well, we've got a, a copper electrode, or a copper contact contacting a zinc electrode in solution with zinc ions and chloride ions and silver chloride, and then a silver wire in contact with the copper wire. Again, remember how we've described this before, the potential of this cell is going to be equal to the potential of the copper interface minus the potential of the other copper interface. And we can write directly that the, the uh, electrochemical potentials of the electrons in that copper interface is equal to the chemical potential of those electrons in the copper interface. Oops, not prime. Yeah, well, we can make them all primes, I guess. And how are we doing? Go off the page here. And likewise, we can write for the other electrons in the copper like so. And if we 
we have room over here, we can say that the difference between the electrochemical potentials of the electrons in those two interfaces is equal to now the Faraday times the inner potential of those two uh, interfaces. So our E cell is just a difference between the, is, is really a function of the differences in the electrochemical potential of the two, interf of the two phases, the two copper phases. So if we consider this to be true, we can say our E cell is equal to the difference between the the electrochemical potential is divided by the, the Faraday. Okay, so we have this sort of um, result. Whenever we have a, a potential difference that we've measured between two metals, we can, can simply consider that potential to be different, the difference between the uh, electrochemical potential of the electrons in, that, in those two metals. So in those cases, the two copper electrodes that we've contacted it with, the electrochemical potential of the, two, of the electrons in those two phases is, the, is what sets the cell potential. Well, we can go a step further than that. Oops. And we can use these concepts to calculate rigorously, rigor, rigorous calculation of the cell potential using the idea of our electrochemical potentials. So let's do that. Let's, let's take an example where we take a copper electrode, again, hooking it up to the zinc, zinc 2 plus chloride. Let's now put in a, a phase, uh, a porous, a semi-permeable membrane, and we'll call this phase, phase alpha. And then if we put in another phase with iron 3 plus and iron two plus and chloride with a platinum electrode and then Cu prime. We can try to calculate you know, using our electrochemical potentials the um, cell potential of this particular system. To do that, what we have to do is write out the complete E equilibrium expression for the chemical and equilibrium potentials. We'll start with writing the equilibrium expression for our cell. Remember, as we've written it, we're going to be considering on the anode side the oxidation of something, and that's going to be the oxidation of the zinc metal. And the cathode side, we'll be thinking about the reduction of the iron three species. So the way we're going to write that is we're going to write zinc metal plus two iron three plus species plus two electrons coming from the copper prime going to zinc two plus and two iron two plus species and uh, two electrons coming from the uh, copper side and two electrons coming from the platinum side. Seems like we don't have enough electrons here. Let's see. Got six and six. Okay, we've got plenty. I'm going to erase that. Okay, 
So that's our equilibrium expression. All we can do is we can expand that expression, including now chemical and electrochemical potentials. So at equilibrium, if the system is at equilibrium, which it's not necessarily, but if we assume it is, then the electrochemical potentials of the zinc in the zinc metal plus two times the, the chemical potential, electrochemical potential of the iron three species in, in phase beta plus two times the um, electrochemical potentials of the electrons in the copper prime phase has to be equal to the electrochemical potentials of the iron, oops, uh, uh, shoot, sorry, has to be equal to the electrochemical potential in species alpha of the zinc ions plus the electrochemical potentials in species beta of the iron two plus ions plus um, two times the uh, electrochemical potential of the electrons in the copper uh, phase. Okay. Now this may be a little confusing to you. It, in fact, it, it requires a little bit of thinking about how to, how to do this. But remember, we're saying that we're if we think about the electron flow in the system, we're talking about uh, zinc plus iron plus two electrons coming from the copper prime uh, electrode results in zinc two plus plus two um, iron two pluses and two electrons going into the copper uh, phase, okay? And so we can write our equilibrium expression like so. Now you could in fact include the electrons going in and out of the platinum phase, but I've left that out because it actually doesn't make any difference whether we include the electrons coming in and out because just as many electrons go into the platinum phase as leave it. So it does, turns out it doesn't make any difference. So now we have this expression for the electrochemical potentials. Now if we want to uh, convert that into a thermodynamic expression, we can convert those into chemical potentials and potential differences. And so what we'll do is, um, first of all, write it so that we know that uh, we're on the right track. We'll write the, the uh, differences in the electrochemical potentials of the electrons in the copper phases, like so. And remember, that's just like we just did. Um, let's see. I think you're right. Here? Uh -huh. Yeah. I just want to make sure that's balanced. So we've got, yeah, okay, that's right. All right, so this is our that, and then we've already, we've already said what that is. That's the cell potential. So that's two times the Faraday times E cell. And so that's the potential, that's the actual physically, physical thing that we can measure is the cell potential. And so that turns out to be equal to um, the rest of that if we rearrange and expand it out. And that equals to, I have to look at my notes because I get confused if I <laughs> try to do it by hand. Um, the uh, standard potential of the zinc ions in species alpha uh, and the activity effect of those ions in species alpha, in phase alpha, of zinc ions in phase alpha plus the electrostatic effect of those zinc ions in phase alpha. Okay, so this is, these are all for the zinc ions in that 
phase alpha, the chemical effect and the electrostatic effect that we've talked about. Then we can do it for the, uh, for the iron ions, the standard chemical potential for the iron uh, two plus. Is that right? Right, and plus the activity effect. Um, oops, sorry. Let me let me just take this out and remember that's the um, uh, activity of zinc two plus and phase alpha. So, so let me rewrite this. It's the, it's the log of the activity of iron two plus in phase beta, and that's squared because of the stoichiometric coefficient in that system, plus four F phi beta. Now it's four because we've got um, a charge of two on the iron two plus and it's also multiplied by two in the stoichiometric factor. And then we do one more. We do um, the zinc the zinc ion uh, the zinc metal because it's a, a it's a, itself just would be the standard potential of the zinc, and then we can also include the uh, effect of the iron three plus standard potential in phase beta of the iron three plus plus the activity effect like so, and well, that'd be minus. And then it would be minus six phi, six F phi beta. Sorry, I've made a mess of that. But. Okay. So let's rewrite this. So our, for our potential of our cell, again multiplied by the Faraday. We can collect all of the chem standard chemical potentials and we can rewrite them as delta G. So that's all the, all the chemical potentials, standard chemical potentials in our system would just be equal to delta G. We can collect all of the activity terms like so. And so it would be the activity in phase alpha of the zinc ions plus the activity in phase beta of the iron two plus ions squared and the activity in phase beta of the iron three plus ions squared plus two uh, times the Faraday of the difference in the phase of uh, the interpotential of phase alpha minus the interpotential of phase beta. Okay, we've canceled out uh, the four to six to give us, our, give us our number. And it seems like that should be negative, but. No, I think that's right. So just to reiterate what I think I've already said, the delta G zero is just gonna be equal to the standard chemical potentials in phase alpha of the zinc two plus, plus the uh, two times the standard chemical potential of the uh, iron two plus in phase beta, minus the standard potential of the zinc in the zinc and the standard chemical potential of the iron three plus 
in phase beta. And that also equals minus two times the Faraday of the standard, uh, standard potential, standard electrode potential. Okay, so taking this part up here, which we've already uh, derived for our cell potential, we can rewrite it again, and we see that E is equal to E0 minus RT over 2F, natural log of activity and species alpha of the zinc ion, the activity and species beta of the iron 2 plus ion squared, plus the act over activity and species beta of the iron 3 plus squared, plus a difference in the phase between the beta and the alpha phases. Difference in the potential, I should say. So what do we have here? Well, first of, the first part of this is the Nernst equation. Okay, now we've derived it now in a, in a way that's, that's fairly rigorous. We've used the, a concept of electrochemical potentials and using those electrochemical potentials we can come up with the Nernst equation. So before we've just written down the Nernst equation, here we can see how 